everyone's going to ask you about Dean Douglas and the yeah. click and stuff like that. I'm not going to ask you about that because one thing you did mention about your second WWF tenure, which I found particularly interesting, was the yes man culture when you were doing your first interviews, your first promo. So can can you take us back to when you first encountered that and were you even expecting uh, sort of like a being hamstrung creatively that much? Yeah, for me, that was a uh, was like one of those moments because uh, having come from ECW and having been around the business for a good bit, uh, you know, there's a time when you're fresh in the business where, like Dominic told, told you, keep your mouth shut and you sort of go along and play, Simon says. Uh, but after a while, you start to get to understand a bit more and, and, and start to, you know, throw some ideas in. And, you know, it's, it's trepidatious at first, but, you know, when you're working, say, with an Eddie Gilbert and say, hey, I was thinking about something like this. Uh, he might listen to it, might use it, might not, but you at least start to get the feel of, of, of uh, you know, uh, working together, you know, uh, combining, uh, I always say two heads better than one. And having done that prior and then going to ECW and pretty much other than the finishes of the matches, my matches were mine and my opponent's creations. Uh, it's what we came up with. And so we had a ton of artistic input and it, it was very liberating. A little bit intimidating at times, but it was also very liberating because you were steering this ship, uh, you know, painting the paint, paint, painting the painting. Uh, and when I went to WWF, it was just, you know, here's the teleprompter of words and go out and do this and turn this way and do that and do this. Uh, and I, I remember going up there uh, for the first several months that I was there, two, three months, I was not on the road. I was going to the studios on Sundays and recording the vignettes. And uh, to call them boring, it was it was excruciatingly boring because Vince wanted me to talk in that monotone voice. I was known for my fiery rhetoric and, and oratory uh, and inflection. And uh, but I was willing to go along. This is Vince McMahon. I'm willing to learn and, and continue trying to grow. And uh, the one we had done six that day and. Uh, on the sixth one, I was just so bored of hearing my own voice. And, you know, and I'm looking around the room and camera guys are like this. You know, the sound guys, everybody's like, oh. And I, I'm thinking that these guys are bored. You know, then what, what are the viewers at home going to be, right? I can't imagine any six, eight, ten-year-old kid going, oh, here's that boring guy again. Let's watch it. <laughs> so I said, uh, Vince, can I do that last one again? Uh, I'll use the same delivery, uh, same uh, verbiage. Uh, but just, a, I'm sorry, I'll use the same verb, it's just a little different delivery. He said, sure, let's see it. So uh, I did the Dean Douglas uh, uh, promo vignette as the franchise, uh, pounding my fist on the podium, laughing, scratching the board, uh, tons of inflection. And right as I got done, you know, the room went quiet. And were, I, I can see the faces. Uh, Stan Lane, uh, Michael Hayes was in there. Jim Ross was in there. The sound text, the lighting text camera techs, uh, the hair and makeup girls, they're all now perked back up, right? I guess from this, now they're like watching. Right as I get done, Vince gets called out of the room on a, on a call. So while he's out of the room, I see Michael against the back wall. Uh, I was always a big fan of Michael's mic work. And so I said, Mike, what'd you think of that? He goes, his exact words, I don't know about anybody else, kid, but that last one was fucking hot. I knew it was a better vignette. And then I went to stand Jim and then started pulling the people in the room before Vince came back. I had gone through every person in that room and every person in that room, not a single one other said, yeah, that last one was compelling. That was, it was fascinating. It drew me in. He comes in with his glass. I have my glasses and I can mimic him. Uh, he has his glasses down on the end of his nose. Right. And, uh, holding a cup of coffee and he's leaning against, there was a window and a table right there. I mean, I just seared into my brain. Uh, and he's leaning. I said, what'd you think, Vince? And he went, well, I appreciate what you were trying to do, but, and then he went like this and made eye contact with every person there. And didn't say a word, just scanned an eye, eye lock with everybody. And he finally looked back at me and he said, but I think I like my way better. What's everybody else think? And every person in that room who five minutes ago were saying the last one was great or fucking hot. But yeah, that's what we told him, Vince. We told him your way was better, too. And it was at that moment, because, look, Paul Heyman, for all his warts, uh, when you went to him and if he had an idea on something and you said, yeah, Paul, but, and, and explained it to him, he'd go, yeah, you're right. Go, go the other way. 
he was very amiable and open to, you know, to collaboration. And uh, when I saw this and I it just instantly like coalesced all in my head that, you know, here I am in a place as powerful CEO and everybody's scared to death of this guy. Nobody will tell him, hey, your shit stinks. Uh, you know, it, you know, if I if I got a big old booger hanging out of my nose and I'm getting ready to go on an interview, I hope someone goes, hey, Shane, you know, yeah. like wipe your nose off, you know. And uh, and I'm not gonna go, who the hell are you to tell me to wipe my nose? Um, but yeah, that's Vince. You know, and he's been successful in a lot of ways by being like that. Uh, and I think in in other ways, he's not been very successful. You know, I, I don't think it's it, you know, it, it's way too easy to sit there and say that when you hear all these people that leave, uh, you know, saying similar versions of the stuff that I've said and, or, and adding some things. And, and to me, it's, it's, it's very transparent when I hear somebody say, I'm not going to say anything bad about the WWE. It was a great experience. I thank Vince and everything else. And, you know, in the back of their head, they're going, this is my Roger <laughs> uh, you know, it, you know, be real. I, I mean, like to me, it's for better, for worse. I, I, I would hope that the fans, know that whenever I'm saying something, it's because I fervently believe it, not that uh, I'm making it up or I'm embellishing it. Uh, you don't have to embellish the stories in this business because they pretty much are, are bad enough on their own. Uh, if anything, I think we probably toned them down uh, because, you know, so, you know, the story earlier with, uh, with Eddie, uh, you know, there's some things I think that, that don't need to be set out in the public uh, or on the ethernet. Um, but yeah, it was at that point that I realized, like, this is why the product looks like this. You know, if everybody's afraid to death, to say, and my guess is because if you do say something, Connor, we'll, we'll get rid of you and find somebody else to do this podcast. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a strong leader uh, to make those decisions and be decisive. It's another to, to sit there and say, I just want you to mimic back to me everything that I say, uh, because, I, you know, I think that has a, a real cancerous effect on the product. Yeah, what I find is so weird is you hear stories about maybe the late, late 90s, early 2000s where Shawn Michaels would be very combative uh, with his opinions and Steve Austin, other people were not afraid to tell him, your stuff sucks, this is how we should yeah. do it. And Vince would actually listen. So yeah. why, as far as you know, I know you weren't there in the late 90s, obviously, but as far as you know, does he go through stages of listening to people and then stages of being a, a, a despot, basically? Yeah, I, I think that Vince... Uh... You know, like when those guys, I'm sure Vince, again, just this is my imagination uh, working. I would think that if when those guys first bowed up to him, uh, he probably walked out of the room steaming and thinking the ways he's going to screw with them and do everything else. And then watched the performance and saw these guys are amazing in ring talents um, and the fans are reacting and uh, uh, Steve's T-shirt sales are shooting through the roof uh, and probably was like a reluctant Johnny come lately. Uh but he, you know, I've heard these stories from long before I was there. Uh, I've heard them since I've been there and I saw them when I was there, but he does, you know, I would imagine his conversations with say, you know, Hulk Hogan or Jake Roberts or Randy Savage are probably far different than they would be with say Shane Douglas or uh, Marty Jannetty. 